So, um, so our goal here today is to kind of give an overview of kind of why we're even starting this homeschool collective, and then the big overview of kind of where uh, you know kind of where our big long term goals are as an organization within this community and the bigger sort of community. And then I have two friends who are homeschool. They they're like a homeschool duo, and who do direct instruction and precision teaching. And they're actually going to come and share some, just share their perspectives and how things are going for them, and um, share about the model, the direct instruction and precision teaching model, and how they how that applies to what they're doing. So the uh, you know. The goal that I'm, you know, that we're setting is that we're, our goal is to build a collective of literacy coaches, what we're calling global literacy coaches, empowered with skills in direct instruction, precision teaching, PACs, which are pro-social skills, and self-directed education. So the... Um, Um, so today is September 10th. Um, we're here at the Vogue Tech Center. I always like to talk about you know, where we're at in the moon cycle because everything that I've been doing over the past year has been kind of trying to align my activities to the moon cycle. And because this is something that I had learned uh, to give myself some grace because there's, you know, there's ebbs and flows and how life moves. And I was the kind of person who was like, if I'm not going 110% all the time, there's something wrong with me. And then my friend was like, there's just, there are natural cycles in life and human, you know, in living. So just give yourself some grace and it's okay. And it's actually, it's a fun way for me to kind of keep connected, you know, keep generating uh, momentum for myself. Because we have this uh, cycle. Um, today, I always like to, when I do presentations, I like to look up what, types of observances are happening that day. And today is the two that came up that I thought were relevant were World Swap Ideas Day and World Suicide Prevention Day. Because what we're talk, gonna be talking about literacy and literacy rates are directly connected to long-term social outcomes, um, which suicide is one of those, one of those things. Um, so in a way of introduction, my name is Abby, Abigail Twyman. Um, one of the things that I've learned that I have learned and embraced over the past year is this idea of a land acknowledgement. And so it's actually let's go over to the one. Um, so about a year, so last summer I had the opportunity to attend a, an organizer summit with the Native Movement that's out of Fairbanks. And they really they expressed the importance of acknowledging the land on which we are. And so I wanted to acknowledge the fact that we are in Tlingit Mami, which is the, the traditional homeland of the Tlingit Haida and Shoshone people. As I mentioned, I always work and synchronize my activities to the moon cycle. And I'm also also like a, a, you know, am, amateur budding photographer. And so this is my my moon picture. <laughs> um, and the, the way that we talk about kind of the moon cycle and how it aligns to what it is that we're doing, we say the beginning of the month when it's the new moon, that's when we set our intentions. And then the uh, first quarter moon is when we're exploring ideas or we're kind of we're exploring possibilities. What are we going to do? And then the full moon is when we're making decisions. We're like, okay, boom, this is what I'm going to do. I'm committed to this. And then the end of the month is when we're, you know, we're actively executing upon those things that we said that we wanted to do. And then at the end of the moon cycle, that's where we're reflecting back what went well, what didn't go well, what, you know, what can I carry forward into the next month to keep me, keep me moving forward. Um, I'm also a humanistic behavioral scientist. So my background is in um, neuroscience as my undergrad and then my graduate work was in special education and behavior analysis. 
I've spent the most, the majority of my career actually working in both special education and in clinical applications of behavior analysis, particularly focused on working with families um, of autistic people. And so doing family coaching and working with families. So that is you know, um, you know, the, the, the lens through which I see the world and am working. All right, so our objective today, so the things that we're gonna talk about are, um, I am a big person. One of my things that I say about myself is that I'm a data-driven optimist, which to me means that, um, oh, I just did it. Um, so being a data-driven optimist, And even if it's like, oh, that doesn't look very good, what it gives me is a clue about what's, you know, what's happening right now and where we need to go. And so the first objective is to, what I would, I would like to empower us with some global literacy data, just to give us an idea of what's actually happening in the world and what's actually happening locally, um, to give us some context for the, the work that we're doing. Um, I'll share the, uh, the values and the vision for our Alaskan Oasis, talk about the mission and the goals, and you'll see this, this hashtag, our AO, that's I'm trying to, you know, have some brandable marketing things. <laughs> um, then we'll talk about um, our preferences for future group classes. So there's actually a, a survey, I think you have it right there on top, Lynn. Um, just to get some feedback about some things that we might want to do as a community and, you know, to bring some people together from around the island. Um, and people, you know, we've been very isolated and haven't had a lot of opportunities to get together. And I want to make sure that we're um, offering, uh, offering things up for families. We have our homeschool duo that's going to be coming and talking to us. And then we're going to be talking a little bit about project follow through and kind of the goal is that I hope that you're all motivated to join us and share with anybody, you know, anyone else in your network who might be wanting to join us and kind of take their homeschooling experience to a different, um, to a different level. Um, whenever I do um, presentations or whenever I'm kind of engaged in more kind of cons uh, conversations, I like to talk about what are like how I how I approach um, coming together in community and having conversations and what we what we take away from this place and so the agreements that we have just as our, our general um, the general overview is that we will only share stories in a way that protect uplift and inspire and empower others um, so that's um, very important so we're not um, taking things out of here, if you're, you know, if you're working with, if you're talking to another homeschool collective member, anything that you share outside is a, like a, a, a life lesson. Um, we're listening for understanding and we're mindful of our impact. We're committed to learning and unlearning. We can pause if we kind of, we start talking and, you know, maybe kind of go off track. I have these key terms, waste, why am I still talking or Gelmo, good enough, let's move on. Um, I like to gather gems or quotes from when we're talking. And if you, um, if you ever have an opportunity to speak but are not comfortable, you're welcome to pass. And we focus on using sound verbal behavior, which is this measured and deliberate speech where we're very mindful about how we're speaking and what we're saying. Do you have any questions about that? No? Okay, so general overview for today, we're going to be looking at some global literacy data, doing the overview for our Alaskan Oasis. We have the survey um, for you to fill out while we're getting prepared and set up for um, Adriana and Connie, who are the homeschooling um, duo that will be coming and talking to us. And then we'll, we always end with um, an invitation and, a, and our commitments, our committed actions. So last 
year, um, one of my professional colleagues, her name is Dr. Kimberly Behrens, published a book called Blind Spots. And in this book, she detailed kind of the history of education and the um, like educational outcomes and things that have happened over the past 50 years that are um, concerning. So she is a, um, Dr. Kimberly Behrens, she's the, um, one of the founders of Fit Learning Centers. And they use a direct instruction and precision teaching model to do intensive remedial academics. And in, her, in that book, she started to really kind of open my eyes about some things that I was not aware of. In my training, I had a very small bit of training in precision teaching, but nothing, we, they never, we never really talked about direct instruction or academic instruction because the um, population that I was being trained to work with or what, were, what they were termed in at that time was low incidence disabilities or their severe and moderate disabilities. And so I was never really aware of um, what was going on in the general education realm. And so her book really got me, um, like opened my eyes that there's a kind of a bigger, there's a bigger issue happening. And so we, um, so in that book, she showed that since the seventies, there has been like our educational data has actually been very stagnant and there are, um, many children who graduate high school who are not proficient in reading. They're not proficient in math. They're not proficient in writing. And, um, and then even, and then when you start to pull out um, different demographics, so looking at um, different, you know, um, like uh, minority groups or um, economically disadvantaged or special education populations, then the outcomes were even um, worse. And so I started to, after I read that book, I started to do a little digging and really trying to just to wrap my mind around what was, you know, what the data were showing. And so I pulled out a couple pieces of information here. So UNESCO is the United Nations Education and Science Council. I, I'm probably watching what that exactly stands for, but it's the United Nations um, um, educational branch. And so what they report is that there are 773 million youth and adults who can't read and write. And there are 250 million children who are failing to acquire basic literacy skills. So that's big, that's close on the global scale. And then when you um, kind of fo uh, focus in a little bit more, and look at the United States. In the United States, 40, 43 million adults are functionally illiterate, which is one out of every five, um, which is very high. <laughs> and then, um, and then when you look at the um, student population, the um, statistics are pretty sad. That 66% of eighth graders are below proficient in reading. And it doesn't get better when you look at you know they they test through 12th or 10th grade. And it doesn't magically improve. Um, and kind of to layer on top of that, when you look at kind of literacy rates, and um, the, there's been studies, and mainly by the Annie Casey Foundation, that is showing that if for those children who are unable to read by third grade, the long-term outcomes for them, so in the like social and health indicators, are um, indicating that they're kind of in what we would consider like failing to thrive in life. They're just not, you know, continuously struggling with mental health issues, substance abuse, domestic violence, low, you know, um, houselessness, joblessness, and things like that. And so. It, that really got me curious about what was specifically happening on Principal Island, because you know, it's you know, it's one thing to look at the whole entire world, but it's you know, once you zoom in and really look at what's happening, that's where you know, what, you know, the rubber meets the road, if you will. So, um, so I have, uh, I was raised in Alaska. 
And, you know, I was one of those, one of the families where, you know, had um, mental health issues, substance abuse issues in my family, domestic violence issues in my family. And I, you know, I was one of those people who just, I, you know, tried to fight as hard as I could to get out of that situation. And so I actually went to high school here in Craig. And, but in my, um, after my sophomore year, I was, you know, I was that kid who was like, there's nothing here for me. I need to get out of here. I need to get off this island. I need to go somewhere else. And so, you know, I left and ran with, you know, everybody was saying like, you got to go, you got to get to, you know, got to go to college. Um, and so I did that. And then I had the opportunity to move back here almost five years ago. And what I, um, kind of what I experienced as a child, you know, I, you know, that was just my, my childhood experiences. I didn't really put, they weren't really in perspective until I came back here and actually started working within the educational system and seeing that like my experiences and then what I know now through training and education in kind of the education system, and then coming back and observing from, um, you know, a professional standpoint, and a community member standpoint, it really became clear to me that there was something more going on that I didn't, I didn't know, you know, why, I didn't understand why we were having these issues, but I, you know, note, I was um, identifying that there was a, an issue. And so, um, so I started to look a little bit deeper and um, began to look at our local data. And so this is a big table with lots of information on it, but I have kind of highlighted, <laughs> highlighted the section that I really want to want to bring to your attention. So every year students do annual testing and then those data are available on the state website and available for anyone to access. So what I did is I went to that website and I started pulling information from the four school districts that serve our island. Um, and these reading data are from 2018, 2019. That was the, um, there's, because of COVID, there was a gap in testing. Um, and the new, the most recent data are not completely out yet, but um, I'll show you uh, on the next slide, I'll show you some additional information that's showing that this isn't changing, nothing's, it's not, it, it has been pretty stagnant over the years. So what you can see here is that the, um, the percent of students on the island who are testing below proficient in reading is 61%. And that's oh, kind of all the grades that are tested are third through ninth grade. When you break out by demographics, and they have a lot of different demographics that you could pull out, but I just pulled out two in particular. I pulled out our, the Alaska Native students and then the economically disadvantaged students um, to see kind of what the difference was between um, with the average. And what I found that was that 82% of Native Alaskan students were below proficient in reading and 69% of economically disadvantaged students were below proficient in reading. And so I did a little bit of, I just did a little bit of math <laughs> to do an estimate of what that would look, what that means. If we looked at the whole student body, what that would look like in total number of students who are below proficient. So these are kind of uh, projections or estimates that's showing that this equates to the 61% of all students would equate to over 600 students who are below proficient in reading, 210 of those which are Native Alaskan students below proficient, and then um, there's overlap here between these numbers of the students, but then that would be 396 of the um, economically disadvantaged students. So this is consistent with what is happening across the United States. This isn't part, you know, this isn't something um, unique to Prince of Wales Island, but it's important, you know, my um, zooming in and looking at what's happening locally, I think it's really important to um, put those things into perspective. So 
Um, before we move on and before we kind of talk about um, like over the years, what has been happening with the within the education system and within with literacy, my question first and foremost is, what do you know about project follow through? Okay, zero and zero. Okay, that is not surprising. Um, it's sad, but it's not surprising. Um, so Project Follow Through was a huge government funded study that began in the 60s. And their mission was to identify educational approaches to education that would um, change the trajectory, particularly for um, economically disadvantaged students. So they were, so the, the mission, and this was um, initiated by Lyndon B. Johnson when he was president, the mission was to um, combat poverty through improving literacy, um, which makes sense, right? So if, if we're, if people can read and are literate and then there, it's less likely that they're going to um, to experience poverty. We'll have, there will be additional opportunities available to them. So before we get into the specifics of project follow through, I want to share, oh, just kidding. That is the first thing. Okay, so in, this has been replicated multiple times, but th these are the data that are um, that are on the National Institute for Direct Instruction website, um, because they're uh, very, very driven to ensure that the um, people understand that educational research tax dollars have been spent, millions upon millions, probably over billions of dollars have been spent on educational research over the past 50 years. In the 60s, they started this research project to identify and they looked at this, this study started with nine models of education to compare which ones had the most impact. With the, with the goal being, once, once a research study is done, once they say like, okay, this is the, you know, this has the biggest impact, that is where funding should flow. Like that's the goal of research, right? So we have a we have a question: What's going to impact literacy rates and thus poverty? We have different options, different things that we're going to look at and we're going to compare, and then the outcomes should then drive future actions. And so what they did was they actually um, they compared different approaches to education direct instruction, parent education, behavior analysis, um, Southwest Labs and academic program, and then a number of pro uh, programs focused on um, problem solving and self-esteem. And what they found over all of those years, so these were different school sites were dedicated to doing one program and then comparing results over time. So this was a 10 year study. What they found was that direct instruction was the only approach to education that delivered robust outcomes in basic academic skills, problem solving skills, and then there was a, an, an extra bonus of improvements in self-esteem. Direct instruction doesn't target specifically self-esteem, but they found that there were um, positive benefits to that. So, this study was replicated, like I said, it was this study was replicated a few times with the same results. And, um, but unfortunately, what happened was that there was no like specific direction that this is what we're going to do. This is what the research study concluded. And this is what our, you know, our recommendations and our guidance from a federal and state level are going to be. There was none of that. They basically said, Yes, this showed that you know this was the most robust and the most had the most profound impact, but basically schools can do whatever they want. So then that kind of 
has brought us to where we are at today, which has shown that there has been little to no improvement. That 66% below proficient has been relatively stagnant since the 70s, which is saying that nothing has significantly changed. There hasn't been a widespread adoption of direct instruction. And is that through all forms of education, public, <laughs> private, at home? Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. So, yeah. This is chart saying that like, these other methods are actually you know, like detrimental, like is that what I'm saying? Um, so, essentially, that they're not, so it's, there is not, no positive impact. No, no it's actually a loss of it. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. and then, yeah, just trying to see exactly what it's saying. Yeah. So, can you give, is, mm -hmm. do you have enough time for me to give examples of what it, all these other ones are? Because it's like Montessori, so it's like, what are those forms of education? Um, so I can, I'll, I can provide you the link and we actually have, um, yeah, so then we actually have, and, and I had, um, failed to do some, um, core introductions, um, but we have here, um, Michael Maloney, who actually worked directly with, um, Zig Engelman is the developer of direct instruction. Um, and Michael Maloney has been my uh, mentor for the better part of this year and has was directly involved in some of in some of these efforts. So Michael, the question was um, if or uh, what are what are these other programs and what do they look like? What did they include? Well, Abby, we would have to spend a half a day to go through all of that information. Uh, I would suggest we just let the data speak for itself. Take a look at the number of programs in the Latin, this right hand side of the chart in which the students in the control groups scored better or sp scored more poorly than the children in the experimental groups. So what we know is that these programs completely fell on their face and they are not going to solve our educational issues. On the other hand, we also know that direct instruction consistently finished first in every single category, including uh, self-esteem, which was a surprise. So. Um, as, as a scientist, I could spend a long time looking at what happened with the team uh, project, but I question the value of doing that as opposed to looking at direct instruction and saying, hey, let's uh, pay a little more attention to that and get that in the hands of more people. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michael. So, um, this is a, a, a data display that you are not yet familiar with. However, um, as a homeschool collective member, you will be trained in precision teaching. And one of the, um, or like the data display used in precision teaching is the standard acceleration chart. So this is, um, what, I, what I want to point out here, so these, uh, this chart is showing the educational outcome data, the reading data on Prince of Wales Island starting from 2010 and all the way up until this or the um, last testing, which is, um, it was the 2018-19 school year, which is this last data point here. So you'll see here the dots um, represent the number of students above proficient and the X's indicate the number of students below proficient. And so from 2010 to 2015, you can see that there were a lot of students who were, who were indicating above proficient and um, a lower amount, but still pretty stagnant, um, indicating um, below proficient in reading. In 2006, or sorry, and um, 
in 2015, they changed to from this um, uh, standards based assessment to the Alaska measurement of progress. So they were modifying the testing based on the um, Common Core. And um, when that test was introduced, the data flipped where there is a lot more students who were who on that test indicated that they were below proficient and a, and a lot less that were showing that they were above proficient. Um, there was a gap year in 2016, there was no testing. And then 2017 was the beginning of peaks testing. So again, it's still showing um, that there was a lot more students who were kind of based on this, you know, the, um, the standard, the standards that were set forth by the government that they were testing well below proficient. Um, and the, the red lines here are just showing kind of there's a change that happened between um, what was testing. But what I want to draw your attention to is here, these in for the, the last kind of the since peaks testing was um, instituted, that there's still a high number of students who are testing below proficient and a low number that are testing above proficient. And again, like I said, this is this is pretty, this is consistent. Um, across time um, and across the United States. Um, and so thinking back to what I was saying before about the, um, the book by Kimberly Barrett that was kind of highlighting these, these data across the United States, um, and then looking at the uh, looking at what happened after project follow through, there was, um, so there was no widespread of adoption of direct instruction. And there was, um, so the um, kind of business as usual has just been, go has been going on. And there's um, kind of a, a stagnancy in data. But what we do know through project follow through and through you know, 50 years of research since is that direct instruction and then paired with precision teaching, which is a, a fluency-based approach to education, um, that shows consistently the most robust results. As I began getting, you know, getting um, mentored by Michael, and coming in contact with other teachers who, who use direct instruction and precision teaching, I got to hear quite a few really profound stories. And so I wanted to share two of those with you. The first story was one that Michael shared with us during our initial training. And it was actually about um, a, an older gentleman who was a truck driver, a long haul truck driver. And and he was, I think it, and correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, but I think he was in his, you know, in his 50s and had been seriously injured on the job and was no longer able to do the job of long haul trucking any longer. And so when that happens, you know, there's an, an acquired disability, then the um, Department of Labor gets involved and there are retraining opportunities. Through that process, they identified that this person and amongst others that they were involved with were functionally illiterate. And so they were not able to be hired and you know, retrained and hired in different areas because they were um, because of their literacy. And so um, and so it's in Canada, um, Michael's in Canada. And so the Canadian government reached out to um, Michael's organization and said, hey, we've got, you know, you have this literacy program. We've got these adult learners who need, um, they're, you know, illiterate and they need help. You know, what, what can we do? So they got together and they started working with this group of adult learners with the um, Maloney method, which is a um, direct instruction based reading program. And so Michael told this story about how um, he was, you know, he was working with this gentleman and, you know, for, for a while and he was making really good progress and he was learning how to read. And one day he came in and Michael said that, you know, he's this big guy and came in and looked, you know, to the scowl on his face and looked like he was really upset and really angry. And, you know, Michael was wondering what was going on with him. And, 
So, you know, they started their session and we're working through things, but he still had this look on his face, on his face, like he was about ready to, you know, come across the table at Michael and, you know, hurt him. And, and Michael finally asked him what, you know, what in the world is going on? And the guy slammed his fist on the, on the table and said, this is it. This is all I needed to do to learn how to read. There's nothing wrong with me. I could actually learn how to read. And it was like, and that story when Michael told me it, it's just so um, eye-opening because it was like, because to me, I've seen this in my own life. I've experienced, you know, interacted with adults who have a hard time with reading. They have a hard time with math and they internalize that. They think that there's something wrong with them, that there's, you know, there's something that they're incapable of learning. But what Michael was, Michael and um, colleagues and all, you know, all of the people who have been doing this educational research for the past 50 years have demonstrated time and time again, that there is nothing wrong with the individual. It just means that they have not come in contact with the right instructional strategies. The motto that, um, that Zig Engelman came up with and is, you know, has been carried through all of the years is that if the learner didn't learn, the teacher didn't teach. And that's not a, that's not a, um, you know, some, we're not talking negatively, we're not trying to talk negatively about teachers. It's just that most teachers have not been trained on the technology of teaching and the, te and the, and, um, the technology of behavior and learning, um, which, um, which means that they're, you know, they're not equipped, they're not prepared to do the, the, the type of instruction in the way that the kids need it to maximize success for everybody. Yes. Can I just add one minute in here? Yes. Mr. Moyni, you say. Mm -hmm. um, no, I can certainly see that. Like my, my eldest son has got some pretty strong learning challenges in certain areas, as you know, but, um, and he would be in grade five now going into school. And we knew that he had challenges since he was a toddler. So we have been doing every therapy on the planet with him since then, like flashcards, all sorts of reading stuff, and other therapies have helped, but we couldn't get him reading. And it was a mystery as to why he couldn't read. And they're trying all sorts of different things at the school. We've been trying all different things. We didn't get anywhere. And seriously, just a few weeks on your program, and I'm seeing just wonderful progress. His self esteem is going up because he did. He's like, why can't I learn how to read? And even I was baffled because he sort of jumps all over the page, goes forwards, backwards, upside down. I couldn't. I'm like, what is he seeing? Like, he's seeing something different to me. Yeah. So it was a real mystery, but mm -hmm. this method's working, and we're all a lot happier in the household because we're like, yes, he's going to be able to read. This is great. Because it was just yeah. this one piece of the puzzle that we just couldn't figure out, and no one could figure out in any other method. So, yeah. Yeah. But, and it seems really kind of ridiculously simple how you teach it, but um, it's working so much. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that's the thing is that it is, once you learn it, it is ridiculously simple. It's, um, and, you know, there, there has been a lot of money spent on creating curriculum that end up being so bloated and so difficult for teachers to implement because it, you know, because it's, there's just so much to it and it doesn't really get to the very heart of exactly what needs to be taught in the, you know, the order in which it needs to be taught and, and all of that. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. And then the other, and then the other story that I wanted to share was, um, so there are a lot of kids who get put in, you know, they get placed in special education because they're not making academic gains and they get labeled as specific learning disability. Um, and a lot of money, a lot of money goes into these, you know, these educational systems. Um, but if we're not using the money right, you know, if we're not doing the programs that we know to be effective, then we're not going to be having an impact on the students and we're not actually going to be helping them in the way that they need to be helped. And the one story that I've heard um, in the past few months that really just made it so crystal clear to me was a friend of mine who uh, runs a fit learning center she told me a story of a student that came to them who was in ninth grade 
and they did an, a review of the records for that child and looked back over all of his years in the education system and, and estimated how much money was spent on his education. And they came to the conclusion that over the, his, you know, he, over his um, almost 10 years in public education, there had been about a half a million dollars spent on his education. But he had made like barely any progress. He was, you know, working on the same IEP goals that had been in his, his plan for years and he wasn't making any progress. And so the family decided to seek outside help, went to the STIT Learning Center and within a year, and that cost them, it was like $15,000 for an entire year of intensive intervention, direct instruction and precision teaching that student no longer qualified for special education services. <laughs> and to me, like, you know, take away my, you know, take off my educator hat, take off my behavior analyst hat, and just, you know, simply a, um, a citizen of America who pays taxes that go to fund the education system. That to me is just like, we need to, we need to do better, <laughs> right? Um, so that's what, that is really the kind of the thrust of why this is so important to me and why, you know, I've been, you know, I, uh, last year I taught, it was the Eichenhardt Special Education teacher in Southeast Island School District. And it was, I was, um, I was able to get funding through, um, there's the extra COVID funding. I was able to get funding to bring in Michael and get some training and get some training for myself and really start to implement these programs. I was able to implement them and start to see how effective it was. And, you know, I became extra passionate about it, but I, what I really um, came to see was that there are some major barriers within, this, within the system to, adoption of a system like this and a program like this. Um, and that's what made me start to kind of shift my thinking that um, I need to approach this problem from a different angle. So many times when changes are tried to be done from the top level, kind of that administrative level down, it's difficult to get buy-in and difficult to implement things. However, if we start to um, approach things from the ground level up, from a community-based level, then it's more likely that we are going to, um, it's more likely that we're going to see success. Because if it's community-driven, if it's the families saying, this is what we're doing at home, we know it works, and we want to help. We want to help improve what's happening in our schools. There has been a lot of research done that on um, supplemental instruction. And so not replacing 100% what's being done, but being able to provide that supplemental instruction to um, kind of backfill and, and really lift up, those uh, lift up the families. Um, and we had, um, we have a new friend who joined us. I'll have, pause for a second um, and let you introduce yourself, Tom. Hi, my name is Tom Sabo. I'm a professor at Toro University, just finished up seven years with Florida Institute of Technology and I direct family, uh, family guidance for Autism Care West in Las Vegas, Nevada. I am excited to be joining you. And I'm sorry that I had to come late. So I don't know if there was other people who were here earlier, but I am delighted to be helping you out and participating in this venture. Awesome. Thank you, Tom. Um, we have, I'm here live in our Vogue Tech Center and we have two families here in the audience. Um, so welcome. I'm also gonna to have to step out in five minutes, but I wanted to, to jump in just for a couple of minutes to say, hey. Well, thank you, I really appreciate it. So um, Tom and I have been talking, and so Tom does um, a lot of amazing work. 
Um, but one of the things that he had um, talked about, and this kind of this will come into those like the optional group classes that we might that we can um, consider doing as a collective, is he brings in um, acceptance and commitment therapy and really focused on kind of the self care aspect. So as a parent, making sure that you are in a good place to best support your families, um, and so he has offered up. Um, to provide some um, classes for us, um, if, if that is something that we want. And I, I have lots of potential opportunities. I have been, you know, I've, I've got a vast network of professional colleagues who um, love to, you know, they love the science of behavior. They love to ensure, to help families learn and grow. Um, and so we're really Really, really fortunate to have a have a really awesome group of people. Um, okay, so so that brings us to I kind of gave you the foundation, right? The there's the global literacy data. That's there's what's happening here locally on the island. There's not you know there are no um, improvements happening, no significant improvements. And um, so we need to do something different. And I'm the, you know, I'm a, like I said, I'm a data-driven optimist. So if there is, you know, if the, the data look bad, yeah. However, that means that we have an opportunity to do something profound and do something really um, important. So our Alaskan Oasis was born earlier this year. <laughs> and, so I've worked really hard to develop kind of a clear picture for everybody to see kind of what our foundations are, um, our value set. I kind of created this acronym ACT with pride and that, that encompasses all of our different values. And so the value, the things that we value most are action, acceptance, commitment. We value training pride, precision, respect, integrity, determination, and enthusiasm. And these are the kind of the key terms that I think of when, you know, I, you know, wake up in the morning and I might keep, be feeling tired, but this is, you know, this, these are the kind of the values that keep me oriented to the, um, to the big picture and what keeps me, um, keeps me moving forward. And so we, what we envision for, you know, for the collective is that we're going to be, we, I want, my vision is that we're on the forefront, we're on the ground level of creating a, a, an education system that is much more culturally relevant. It's much more neurodiversity affirming. That is one thing that is a big challenge in the schools. Um, it's trauma responsive. Um, there's been a big push for trauma-informed education, um, but as somebody who has, you know, worked directly in the schools, I can tell you that that's easier said than done. Um, I want, you know, I, I envision an education system that is, has, is rooted in direct instruction and precision teaching, has a high focus on development of pro-social skills, what are called PAC skills, we'll be talking about. Um, and creating nurturing environments and um, using an approach called self-directed education, which is much more child and family centered. Um, and so our, our goal, our vision is to create, to empower children and families who will be effective accomplices in addressing the global literacy challenge. And in your packet um, that I provided, what you'll see, by Tom, thank you, is that um, Michael Maloney, is um, he is a big champion of um, getting direct instruction into the hands of as many people as, the, as are possible. And he's actually developed a, a, um, a digital version of his direct instruction program that is very low tech, that is e and easy to implement that can be used anywhere that you have access to a cell phone network. And so when we say global literacy challenge, I think of global as across the globe and then also a global skill set. So not just reading fluency, but 
math fluency and writing fluency and language fluency and financial literacy and all of those things. Um, so that is kind of, that is the overall goal is to um, have a group of people who are highly, highly trained. Okay. So our mission and our goals um, over the next, I have, we have got 15 years of plans, 15 years of plans laid forth. Um, so this school year, the goal is to work on developing this homeschool collective, begin coaching families, working with students, and really focusing on teaching people about direct instruction, precision teaching, PACS, and um, SDE. Um, our goal is to create a network of direct instruction literacy coaches. So, you know, we want to support homeschool families, and then we also want to take that further so we're, you know, so we can we can have a group of people, we can have a network of people who would be um, able to share their stories of success to, in, you know, to influence other people adopting these types of programs. Um, and then also secondarily to be able to be available as a network of potential um, uh, literacy coaches who could do the, the um, supplemental instruction in, um, in the schools. Because that, that's one thing that came up as I've been talking to families and organizations is how to, you know, I, the, the goal really is to create a network of people who can provide a supplemental service to the school. So we're not saying you're doing something wrong and you need to fix it. It's, we could be doing better and here's how we can help. Right, so if we're um, kind of coming to this from a more community-based um, approach. Um, I want to empower families to effectively advocate for their children. We have, um, a lot of families have put a lot of faith into the school system um, without realizing that, you know, they don't know what they don't know. And so we're, you know, kind of, we want to kind of, empower and arm families with knowledge and skills so we can be better advocates and push for positive change. Um, and then finally, to inspire others to um, join the collective and expand our reach. So the, the kind of long-term objectives to start building the homeschool collective, begin coaching families and students over the next five years to grow our network, um, to serve families across Prince of Wales Island and across Alaska. Um, uh, medium to long-term goal is to um, open what we call uh, just learning centers. So people who become direct instruction literacy coaches could then, you know, uh, more robustly serve their communities. Um, and then our very, very long-term goal is to, so we are um, residents of Naukee Bay, and our goal is to actually develop a transformation and wellness retreat that would be a, like a training center to expand our reach. So people could come here, you know, uh, um, observe our model, look at what we're doing, and then take it and um, replicate what we're doing in their own areas to expand our reach. So the goals for this school year, um, so our goal is to, uh, to grow our collective to 25 families, which means that we'll have the opportunity to, to train 25 families in direct instruction, precision teaching, and PACS tools through weekly family support workshops. So starting next week, we're going to be doing um, weekly workshops. Um, part of it will be like support group here, you know, here's what's working, here's what not. You can share ideas and also um, Michael uh, Maloney has provided us with his uh, modules that he developed for the University of West Florida to do a, um, more a guided instruction on precision teaching, direct instruction, and uh, behavior management. Um, the, we have a goal to coach 12 families as direct instruction literacy coaches who are initially implementing that digital reading program that I was talking about. Um, and then to coach up to three learners in direct instruction, precision teaching, um, 
So this is more intensive support for homeschool families and actually providing some direct instruction to students is our goal for this year. And then over the next five years, um, we're aiming for a two times growth rate over, um, over the next five years. And so our goal is to expand by 2025 to 400 families that we've been able to, um, to serve. And then um, really working to expand the, the um, knowledge set and what uh, direct, the direct instruction literacy coaches can do by providing additional training in the more advanced direct instruction curriculum, um, which is, this is a, this is a good subset. There's, there are more than this available, but these are the ones that give us, would give us like the best, strongest foundation. So if practice makes perfect speech, for speech and articulation. The Maloney Method Toolbox 1 and 2 are, is a reading program. The Maloney Method Math that works on um, math fluency, those foundational skills, language for thinking, hot and handwriting, which is print and cursive handwriting, corrective reading comprehension, expressive writing, spelling through morphographs, essentials for algebra, and academic core, which covers science and social studies. So you can see that. The direct instruction curriculum covers very basic skills all the way up through much more, you know, higher level complex skills. So one of the programs that I look to as a model is called the Morningside Academy, which is down in Seattle. Um, and they have actually published their Morningside model of, de of generative instruction and they're, they're, they go through grade eight. And they focus, so they're a private academy that brings in students who are struggling in the public education setting, implement you know, intensive programming based founded in direct instruction and precision teaching and have very, very strong, robust results. Kids that weren't able to make progress in the you know, general education environment due to um, academic challenges and behavioral challenges come to their school, get exactly what they need, exactly you know, how they need it, and are making really, really um, profound impact or profound um, improvements. One of the opportunities that, I, that I'd like to consider as, as the collective is in the summer, the Morningside Academy actually does a summer academy and they invite families and um, teachers from all over to come and learn their program. Um, and so that is one, one uh, opportunity that we're going to be exploring is, you know, if there are families and teachers and educators who are interested in, you know, taking part in the Summer Academy, I personally would love to go there and get, you know, get training myself, more intensive training. Um, and so that is a potential opportunity as well um, in the future summers. Awesome. Sweet. So we just had um, another person join us. This is Gail. I don't know, Gail, if you want to introduce yourself, but I'll tell you, tell you guys a little bit. So Alan Naki, have you heard of the um, Eagle's Wings Ministry? It's out there. So the Eagle's Wings Ministry of Naki, it's um, sponsored by the Naki Church, and it is a long-term residential program for women and children, women who are recovering from addiction. And um, it's a, a program that is really intended to deal with the problem that, that happens frequently when you have families who are dealing with substance abuse, where there's a separation of the family. So there's, a, you know, the parent goes to treatment and the kid might go into like foster care or, you know, or have to be separated from their families for some reason, which for the person who's in recovery can be very difficult because, you know, their, their child, that's their baby, right? Um, and that can actually impede recovery. And so the Eagle Twins Ministry Program was designed to actually be a long-term residential program after they've done their initial um, recovery program to be like a, tran a transition program. So there's um, a, a houses for the women to stay, to stay in, and then there, there's going to be 
essentially like a group home for the children. So they'll, they're still in the same community, but the, the, the mothers won't have like primary care responsibilities so they can focus on their recovery, um, but still be able to see their children regularly and, and work on building up their, their skills in that way. And so through that, there are multiple groups of people who come up during the summers to help with building projects to get this the Eagle Saints ministry up and going. And so that brought me into contact with Gail Stevens, who um, lives in Oregon. And she was a special education teacher. And what she heard about our mission and what we're doing here has been so amazing and so supportive in um, helping us um, fulfill our mission and get, get things going. And so she and her crew down in Oregon have been um, graciously collecting materials, school supplies and backpacks and um, games and all sorts of stuff that they're setting up here. So we have, kind of a, you know, we have some um, materials and whatnot for our program um, and for our families. And Gail, if you'd like to introduce yourself, you are welcome. Yeah. Oh, I'm mute. Hello. There you go. There you go. Oh, oh, good. Thank you so much. And I'm so awesomely waiting for pictures to see how this all turns out and how all the kids. I'm so excited for all the kids and for you and best wishes. Thank you so much. We were, she was with a group that was supposed to be coming up this year, um, but due to COVID, they just stay. Serious fires down there. Yes, we do. And also thank you to Larry Brown, who um, started because he talked to you and then he talked to me. And so he needs to have lots of kudos too. Yes. So. Thank you for that. Yes. Larry, Larry Brown. So he actually did come up earlier with one of the groups who was um, um, helping with building projects. And he was um, he was able to provide, he's a music instructor. So he teaches piano and teaches vocal lessons. And so he had offered to provide some lessons to myself because I am trying to learn how to be a better piano player <laughs> and, um, and he provided some classes. And yes, so like Gail said, when he heard about our mission then he went back to his people down in Oregon and was like, we have to do something to help them. So we're very, very grateful to have a, have a growing, um, foundation of amazing supporters. So our um, so here's the here's the big big humongous overview um, for participation and for engagement um, with the collective. And um, everything that I do is always open to kind of open to feedback and open to kind of changing depending on what the needs of the families are. But here's the general overview. So I am going to, starting next week, I'm going to start um, putting out daily challenges. And those are going to include things like a song of the week or a quote of the week or an article. And it's just an opportunity, an optional opportunity for um, engagement and reflection. Not something that you have to do, but something that I just like um, to provide some additional opportunities for um, learning. <clears throat> so I'll be available for um, 8.30 to 9 for, for virtual check-ins on those daily challenges if you, if you are interested. Um, I'll be opening myself up and providing daily direct instruction and family coaching services between 9 and 12, Monday through Thursday. Um, we'll have our, uh, our family support workshops on Friday, so it'll be the same time slot. They will be recorded, so they'll be available within our within the um, collective dashboard for viewing after the fact if you're not able to attend live. Um, but we will be. So these are kind of our you know, three big people who are going to uh, be providing us with a, um, a lot of um, educational opportunities. So we have got Michael Maloney. Who is the developer of the Maloney Method Direct Instruction Program, and he has programs in reading, math, and spelling. 
Um, Tony Biglin is a, um, a researcher and a community organizer who wrote the book, The Nurture Effect. Um, and then Dennis Embry um, is also a um, behaviorist and um, researcher who has developed the PAX tools. And so that, and which are based off of the uh, PAX Good Behavior Game um, and his work to develop that over time. So those are kind of three core people who are going to be contributing to our um, educational journey uh, this term. Um, and then we have an opportunity. I mean, I have just time, I have time blocked off regularly into my schedule for the 10 weeks of this first term from Mondays on Mondays and Wednesdays, four to six, as just a time block for potential um, group learning, group classes or workshops. And so we have people like Tom Savo who are, who are interested in um, providing us with um, workshops on acceptance and commitment therapy and parenting strategies and things like that. Um, I have people in my network who, you know, who are um, relationship and sexuality experts. So, and that's, you know, that is an area that doesn't always get covered in education. And so wanted to make sure that families have opportunities and access to people who can provide some guidance on how to teach those things in homeschool settings. Um, we have people who are, um, who are experts in language development and reading and math and motor skills. And so there's a lot of potential and it's really just gonna be dependent on the needs and the desires of the homes of the collective members. Like what, what do you wanna learn? What, what, what do we wanna do together? And this, um, so that's an opportunity that we can explore together. The PAC shared vision. So this is, so PAC tools are, um, so there's the PACS Good Behavior Game that was developed and implemented in schools. And now they're taking those skill, those strategies and those tools and um, sharing them more widely with families and communities. And the first, um, the first tool skill for PACS is this idea of a shared vision. And so the kind of the question that I would put out there for you is like, imagine the perfect homeschool um, and then um, Thinking, answering those questions like, what would you like to see more of? And what would you like to see less of? And um, next week during on our first official workshop, um, Tony Biglin is going to be coming and talking to us um, so we can um, you know, talk more about the, the shared vision and what that looks like and why it's important. Because as a family, you know, if there's, there's no big vision, then it's hard to know like, where you are and where you're going. Um, so if you have an opportunity to fill that out before you go, that would be awesome. And then just lastly, um, so the invitation, so the Homeschool Collective, um, I'll be actively, you know, putting this out, information out there to all the different homeschool programs, blasting it out, trying to find the homeschool families on the island, um, <laughs> because I know that they're out there, um, but like you're we talking about there, um, you know, a lot of people are kind of keeping to themselves, but the more that we can kind of come together and build these opportunities um, to learn and grow together and work together. Um, and then we have other families like um, Adriana and Connie that, you know, through our network, my hope is that, you know, we can um, build the collective here on the island but then also looking to, you know, include families in greater Southeast Alaska in the greater Alaska and, um, and, and beyond. So, um, so we're offering, so the collective um, kind of the basic level is to, you know, um, to join in and participate in weekly workshops so we can come together and work together and you know, coordinate, um, you know, um, coordinate amongst each other for activities. I'm open and available for family coaching um, every term. And then I'm also open and available for providing, actually providing direct instruction to individual students on an as needed basis um, to help kind of get the ball rolling. And sometimes that's, you know, um, so some families are using the, the digital direct instruction program, which can be done fairly easily by a family. But then, you know, for higher level skills, sometimes it's easier to have somebody else come in and get them started and show you how it works and show you how to do it 
And then you can kind of take that on and take that on your own as you're as you're developing your own skills. Um, and then our other goal is to we put we have put together a GoFundMe. We're um, working to raise funds to purchase the direct instruction curriculum so we can have a library of curriculum available for families and testing kits, and then to be able to provide um, services to families um, on a sliding scale as needed. Welcome, Connie and Adriana. Hello. Hello. Hello, and we've got, so um, Adriana, that we are here at the Vogue Tech Center, and we have three families here in the audience, but you can't see them. You can just see me, um, but they're here and they're listening. Um, so, would you like to start by introducing yourself? Sure. Um, so, my name is Adriana Horn, and I'm a homeschool mom of two boys, and I um, have been a student of um, direct and like a teacher of direct instruction and precision teaching for the past three years, um, namely Michael Maloney, and I've been using his reading program to teach my kids how to read. Um, my oldest son, Samuel, was diagnosed with autism back in 2012 when he was three. And um, since that time, I've done um, a lot of learning on how to best to teach him, um, primarily through uh, applied behavior analysis and, and direct, direct instruction precision teaching. Um, so I, I'm just here to share some of the things I've learned and to um, share our story, Connie and I. Um, and that's sort of a little bit of, of who I am and what I'm about. Hi, I'm Connie Stewart, and I was a homeschool mom of four children. Um, they're now grown. I have adult children who are ages like 20 to 30. Um, and the past eight years, I've been in a classroom setting, and that's where I met Adriana and her family. Um, part of our story together is that the techniques and curriculum I had been using in that setting weren't um, weren't meeting with success for her son and for many of the students. And so through discussions together about um, how we could teach differently and better and keep up with where students actually needed help instead of just flooding more information at them, um, Adriana introduced me to direct instruction and particularly Michael Maloney's reading curriculum. And I have used it to tutor for the past two years. Um, and now I am out of the classroom and, and using it only to tutor students. I started a business working with students with reading using direct instruction and precision teaching. Well, thank you and welcome. We really appreciate you being here. And I know that there's, so <clears throat> we've been talking about direct instruction and precision teaching kind of in, you know, in theory and heard, they heard about uh, project follow through. And so we're really excited to um, hear more about your all experiences. So we have three kind of general guiding questions. Um, and so what I'll, I'll just, Ask the first one, and then you all can um, kind of share share out um, your thoughts. So the first one is, what motivates you to homeschool your children and utilize curriculum founded in direct instruction and precision teaching? Great. Well, when I started out, um, I didn't. So some families are like homeschooling. That's the only option. That's what I want to do. I did not start there. I I was pretty much terrified when I realized really that I had no other option except to homeschool because um, sort of like what Connie was saying, uh, what was happening in the school for both my kids when they were in school, uh, it just wasn't meeting their needs. They were not learning. Um, so I realized if, if they weren't getting what they needed uh, at school that I would have to learn how to do it at home. So I sort of <laughs> very, timidly, I guess, started out. Um, but then I researched, um, and my research goal was to find something that would help me measure uh, my kids, um, like, to, when, when do I know that they've actually learned? And I didn't know how that would, how would that would happen unless I was taking some kind of data. 
So um, when I started researching um, curriculum for, for homeschool, homeschooling, especially reading, that's how I found Michael Maloney's um, pr program. So that was my motivation was to find something out there that I could use, that I could monitor their um, performance. So I would know for, for a fact that they were actually learning. And um, that's how I guess I came upon direct instruction precision teaching. Um, so that was my focus is teaching my children so that they could master, actually master and become fluent in whatever it is I was setting out to teach them, as opposed to just sort of giving them a general, this is information you need and, you know, just sort of absorb it as you can. Because I, at least for Samuel, my older son, that wasn't effective. And for my younger son, who was a struggling reader, obviously that wasn't effective either, because that's what was happening in their school programs. So. I didn't have, um, I wasn't familiar with this program when I homeschooled our children. Um, and I too was timid about that. I think it can feel weighty. And so I want to say how excited I am about finding a program that measures mastery. You don't have to wonder, we're just reading this slew of words and I'm not sure at what point, which sound confuses you, which blend confuses you. When we have direct instruction and precision teaching, it actually means that. It actually means we're gonna pinpoint each of the steps needed. And so now as a teacher and a tutor, and I wish as a parent, I had had that because it's freeing. It's freeing to know this curriculum is right here. These steps are here. We're gonna go on these steps. We're gonna use this process. And it, when we get to a point that it's not working, we're not gonna just continue to flood information. Like, oh, I'm sorry, there's a hole, but we still gotta keep putting water in the boat. We're not gonna do that. We're gonna make sure each step is solid. And that is not only freeing for the teacher, but it, it builds amazing confidence for the reader, for the student. The student begins to um, take hold of their learning. And I believe the pathways, all of the different ways we receive learning, um, one of those ways is an emotional connection to it. And when it continues to be frustrating, children want to try less and less. And teachers and parents want to try less and less. Everyone's frustrated. So to have a method, and honestly, when I first started learning it, I was so overwhelmed by it, by the data. I'm not a research personality. I'm more of a let's talk personality. Um, but watching for the past two years, students gain in confidence and love today, a student said, is tomorrow the day we get to work on this again? I mean, they actually love it. I learned from Adriana's son, um, and that's when COVID hit and uh, we were online. So I would say we, we felt that this deck was kind of stacked against us, like, oh, we're doing all this learning. And even in the midst of that, the student, the children teach you. They are telling you all the time what makes sense to them and where their question is. But having specific data to know how to hear it and answer the exact question has been so rewarding for the student and for us as teachers and parents. That's awesome. I, you know, um, I was sharing earlier that my kind of foray into direct instruction precision teaching did also started during COVID. I had, you know, during my training, I had heard about it, but I had never had been trained or experienced in any of the outcomes. And, you know, my first experience during COVID was kind of needing to continue providing services to students, but not being able to see them in person and utilizing that, um, uh, the technology to be able to do tutoring sessions online. What I found where, you know, I was kind of hesitant at the beginning, but I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be really hard. And, you know, and it was actually way better because I had a student looking at me into my camera, they had headphones on and it was like the best focus I had from this student. And I was able to like fast paced instruction, very few distractions um, and they were really motivated to learn. 
And then the following school year, so this past school year, when I started to get, you know, got training with uh, Michael and started consulting with him and get trained on direct instruction and precision teaching, um, I was, you know, able to continue doing that. And, you know, Connie, you said it, like it becomes reinforcing in, in and of itself. You know, I was a special education teacher and I found myself saying like, I don't want to do anything else because it's so fun and it's so effective. And we had kids who had not gotten intervention, like, you know, hadn't gotten consistent intervention for a really long time, if ever. And they were like excited to come to session, like setting their own timer, you know, setting their own watch timer and being like, is it time yet? Is it time yet? Can we, you know, can we do this? Because it's like, they're excited, they're engaged, they're getting lots of attention, lots of praise, and they're finally, you know, finally feeling successful. Like, oh, I'm not like, I can read, I can do this. It's not, you know, it's, it's not as hard as, um, is it, you know, I, I felt it was going to be, so. Nothing breeds success like success. Mm -hmm. You know, when they feel confident and feel like they've accomplished it, they want to try the next bite. Like, okay, well, let's do this next part then. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's that, yeah, it builds that momentum. It gener, you know, that's what, you know, it's, um, they call it a generative. Um, it's a generative instructional method because it's, you know, one thing it's like, oh, now that opens up this other door. Now this opens up that other door and, and you know, creating those connections where they can see, um, see their own success and also see where they're going. Because I think that has been another challenge I've seen in education system is like, they don't, you know, you don't have, the kids don't have a clear picture of where they're going. And so, you know, it feels very disconnected. Um, so then, so it sounds like what you all are doing, you've had lots of success. You didn't know exactly what you were getting into when you first started it. So you might've felt you were a little bit intimidated got some training and in instruction and direct instruction and precision teaching and have um, found success yourself and your students and your kids are having success. But so what have been the barriers that you found? What have been those challenges and how have you, um, how have you um, overcome those? Well, for me, when I started out, I didn't know anything about anything. I didn't know about anything about teaching. I didn't know anything about direct instruction or precision te um, teaching specifically. I had uh, some background just because my, in applied behavioral analysis, just because I had gone to all the sessions with my son since he was four. Um, so that was like four years of going to each session with him. Um, so I had watched um, them doing, um, you know, ABA type of things. So um, that was pretty much my only exposure. Um, so when I started researching, I first started using just the regular homeschool curriculum um, that you could find that was promoted. I asked other parents, of course, you know, what they suggest. And I did a lot of research. And I tried different things. But ultimately, um, when I, I kept coming up with a roadblock uh, when I was using those cur uh, curriculums was the, there was no measurement tool. It, so I didn't know exactly what my kids knew and what they didn't know. Like it was very confusing and it was very discouraging because I would be like unsure as to what decisions to make as the teacher. Like, do I go forward? Do I stay here? Do I go back? Um, they're making an error here, but it doesn't follow. Like it was just all over the place and it was really discouraging. So once I found, um, direct instruction precision teaching, I, that removed those barriers. And so now I follow what my kids show me, like, as Connie said, like, if they're, if, if they're progressing, and uh, then I just keep doing what I'm doing. If they, they have a um, barrier, if they're not understanding something, um, then those errors show me that that's the area I need to teach to, you know, so um, instead of being discouraged by those errors, those errors just alert me to what I need to focus on. Um, so that was really encouraging and refreshing, um, after a whole year of trying to, you know, figure it out and not really knowing where I was going. Um, the other thing I think you sort of mentioned, Abby, is how one thing leads to another. So as I'm teaching my kids and they're making progress on a certain, um, pinpointed goal, sometimes that, um, opens up areas 
that are related where they're not understanding, or it also sometimes opens up areas that they make connections that they're actually like, oh, that relates to that. And, and it makes them understand wider concepts better. So it goes both ways. It either like progresses their learning or it shows me areas that they, like other areas that are related to whatever is I'm teaching that I also need to address. So it, for me as a teacher, it's, I need to become really agile. I think that's the word agile where, and the, and the things that they're, um, they're understanding and not understanding and just set my, um, my goals towards, uh, what they're telling me as the student. Does that make sense? I think, um, and also I need to learn how to prioritize because I can't do everything. So I need to prioritize, um, you know, what, what those goals are and uh, address them in a sort of, you know, step-by-step -step way. Um, and so the people that I uh, consult with, like Michael and um, some of the other precision teachers I consult with help me uh, tremendously with that, so. That's what I was going to say too. That it it really does have an aspect of community that's been in just invaluable for me. I, I couldn't have learned it without Adriana. I mean, that's really the truth. So if you have others you can talk honestly with, um, some of the um, tools that are used, the chart, the ways that you keep up with the information, may be for people an undoing. For me, it was an undoing as a teacher. I was used to teaching a certain block, testing on the fifth day, teaching a certain block, testing. And in the school settings, typically, that I was a part of, you didn't have the opportunity to, to um, be flexible and adapt. You had to do the next lesson, even if you knew everybody in the room was lost, like you had to stay on track. Um, so that, for me, was an undoing. Like I had to rethink. Okay, if the sound, so if we're talking about reading, since that's what I'm tutoring this year, if you're talking about the eh sound, there's no reason to keep adding if eh is not making sense. We've got to go back. This E says this sound, and it is the most freeing thing to be able to find that. It removed that barrier of here's a whole block of information or a block of words, and the child is struggling. They get this percentage incorrect on Friday, but I don't know if it was Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday. I don't know at what point that block of information didn't make sense. So if you're um, able to unlearn that thinking, which was a barrier for me, and, and realize that every time you see them, you're checking that, you're checking fluency, you're checking mastery, you're checking it every time. I thought that would be discouraging for students, but it has not been. It's been encouraging for them. They know exactly what's happening, but it did, it is, um, it's a different way of looking at it. It's a new and fresh perspective, but it may, I mean, it does require you to have someone, I feel like, to bounce that off of. Like when you see, so, so say you, you know, embrace this, and then I would have students um, plateauing or not progressing. And so I have people to ask, I always ask Adriana, we can go to Michael um, and you'll need to do that. You just need a fresh pair of eyes, like a student who was just really stuck. Adriana had the idea to take smaller bites, like give him 10 seconds, 10 words in 10 seconds. Well, this young man is eight and that was the most amazing thing he's ever heard in his life. He was like, oh yeah, we're gonna do this in 10 seconds. Like he, he works for that in, in our sessions together now. He starts with, do we get to do the 10 second thing? When do I get to do that? You know, and worked through a page of words that we had been stuck on um, simply because I hadn't thought in a new way. So it's so helpful to have a new pair of eyes and people who've walked longer on a path. I mean, that's true in life always. So it's true with this too. Yeah, and I like what you like the comment that you made about it being freeing, like freeing for you as the teacher and then freeing for the students. It just it takes that extra pressure off of it. And we know that, you know, just on a human level, if we're feeling pressured or we're feeling stressed, like we're our brains are in a stress state. And we know that when our brains are in a stress state, we're not going to be learning as well, right? We can't encode memories if we're in a stress state. And so it kind of takes away that extra barrier. 
um, and kind of increases that motivation. And I, you know, I, you mentioned a the timer, and we were talking about that earlier. That you know, where and setting like personal best goals, right? So, um, you know, we're not telling kids like you have to jump to the top of the mountain. We're saying, oh, just take this. Hey, you got ten yesterday. Can you, you know, let's shoot for twelve today? Or how many do you think you can get? Have them set their own, you know, goals. And there's just something so empowering about that for the kids because they're, you know, then they become more in charge of their learning process. And I, I'm always looking at, you know, what, what can we do right now that's effective and what are we doing right now that's going to serve kids in the long term? And I, I really do feel very strongly that setting this precedent on like, this is, this is what learning to learn looks like and you can apply this to anything. Oh, you want to learn the piano? Great. We can break down the piano skills into its component parts and practice each bite size until you're fluent at it and set those goals. And um, there's just something about it, like you said, that's so freeing and so liberating. Yeah, one of the things that I love, a quote I love is, we're not filling a bucket, we're lighting a fire. And that is... To me, that's really true. What you just said, them loving to learn and learning how to learn, that's a lifetime skill that opens the door that has everything to do with the rest of, of who they'll become, who they are as people. Awesome. So, so then let's, I always like to kind of end on a, you know, where are we going? What are your plan? You know, what are your hopes and dreams and aspirations? So um, uh, what are your hopes and dreams for the future? And what words of wisdom can you share with our families? Um, well, for me, um, I just, my hopes and dreams are that my kids would have the necessary foundational academic and social skills um, for a full and productive life, um, that they'd be able to reach their full potential and, um, that I would be able to like model those values that I want them to carry through over into their life, you know, like empathy, compassion, diligence, um, perseverance and courage. Um, and so I want them to be able to, in, as they grow up to be confident in the, in their own abilities to face um, challenges um, with that courage um, where they don't feel like they need to over rely on someone else on, you know, on me or someone um, or to be paralyzed in fear, but to be able to have those um, foundational skills, um, both like their knowledge, but also just their, how they interact with the world, with others um, to, to care for others and to show that. And um, I, I feel like as we model it as parents, as teachers, um, the more they do. So the more that I explicitly tell them, oh, I love how you're doing this, or wow, you're, you, you've surprised me so much with your, you know, how you're sharing or how you're um, caring for me. And <laughs> it's amazing to see how then they start doing it back to me. They're like, mom, thank you so much for, um, for all you do for me. And, you know, like they actually use those words and for, you know, teaching me and, you know, it's just, I mean, I, I'm like, how did they become so sweet? But I'm like, well, I'm trying to share that with them and they're taking it in and that becomes part of who they are. And they, they just feed it back to me and feed it back to others that are around them. And I think it's so beautiful. And I just encourage all of you guys to, you know, have courage, you know, courage sometimes is hard, right? Because it's hard um, to do something that is scary, um, but to be able to do it and to stick with it, to, um, you know, be consistent that I think really, uh, with precision teaching and with direct instruction, it gives you the, like, it gives you the things and you just need to do it day by day, little by little. And, um, it's very rewarding, like Connie said, and, um, and it, it, I think it's good to have that community of other folks who you can share, like Connie said, you know, this isn't working. I need a, a fresh set of eyes. And that is just, I think precision teaching the world of person teaching, at least all the people I've ever met in it, they don't treat you like, oh, you're not an expert or you don't know. No, they're very, they're like, you, we see things, even though we might have different ideas about a whole bunch of other things, we see this as in like a, 
a cornerstone thing and uh, we're willing to work with you and see you as equals. So I think that's a beautiful thing. <laughs> I really agree with all of that and that children are sponges. They're all the time taking in and learning from us. And so when I'll be discouraged, one of the things Adriana says to me is we're learning together. We're learning, we're both learning. And that is contagious. Children then see that, oh, you're learning and I'm learning and it's good to learn and it's safe to learn here. One of the things that's foundational for children is to feel safe and seen and cared for. And when we're communicating that, even with this particular type of teaching, which I think it does, it gives real clear measurements and we all feel safer inside of clear boundaries. If I know where my lane is, I know where to stay and where to go. Like, like Abby was saying, what's the goal? Where am I headed? Oh, this is what I want to do. I did 10 today. I'm going to try for 12 or 15. And um, one of the things that Michael says often is model lead test. And whether we know it or not, we are doing that. We're modeling all the time. We're leading them. And again, with positive reinforcement, who doesn't work better when you're telling someone you're celebrating their uniqueness and helping them build confidence? That helps that fight, flight, or freeze response to calm down, to literally physically, physiologically calm down so that you can learn and move forward. And it gives them the pattern to do that for others. Just like Adriana said, her boys are precious to me. They encourage me. And so there's this overflow of reporting, pouring into a generation that our hope is, and our, I mean, I don't know a better word than hope, is that then that generation is pouring into the next. We're pouring into them in their uniqueness. There's literally no one else on the planet like that student their personality and their story. There's no one else like them. And when we can believe in them and be a part of that story, it encourages them to pour into the lives all around them, their circles of influence. Um, so they, it really, it's a joy to be a part of. It really feels like privilege. Um, sometimes it's intimidating. I love what Adriana said. It, it does take courage and it takes, okay, today may not have been like, oh, the best aha moment ever but we're going to steady do this. We're going to do this next line and tomorrow we're going to do the next line. You know, I think it's A.A. A. Milne. Um, my daughter has this on the nursery of one of my grandchildren. You're stronger than you think, braver than you imagine. That's true. She says that to, to my grandson. And I say that to you as parents that are willing to learn and trying to do what is best for your families. Um, you're stronger than you think and you're braver than you know. Um, so we wish you the best. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you both. That was wonderful. Um, I do want to open up if there's any questions for our guests here. We can pick their brains a little bit. But I'm fascinated with this schoolroom behind the Adrienne here. This looks amazing. I'm just um, enthralled by how you set yourself up there. I don't, can we ask unrelated questions like that? Like, how do you set yourself up? How do you do this? Thing? Yeah, I think that's it. I think that's absolutely related. Environment. So, you know, we were talking about nurturing. We, you know, just a, 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 an emotionally safe and nurturing environment, and then also a physically safe and nurturing environment. So, yes, Adriana, can you share about your? Yeah. Room there. Right. Well, um, I'm so blessed to have, you know, a space like this. Um, when we moved to Signal Mountain, we, we live in, in Tennessee. Um, we were in a rental house and we didn't know really, we actually moved for, um, for my oldest son to be in the best school that we could find at that time. And when that fell through, it was very discouraging um, when we realized that he, it just wasn't working. But when we started out on the homeschool journey, we were in a very small rental home and had no space. Um, but then we were found this house. And when I saw it, I was like, this is perfect. You know, I'm going to make this into my homeschool room. So um, I just brought in the things that I know they like. Um, they like my older son loves moving movement. And so we had the swing that was a gift. Um, so they take a lot of breaks there or um, just look out the window, look at the birds and um, we, we sit at the table together. Um, this year, I've made it sort of a goal that um, 
the best use of our time sometimes is to do more together as opposed to break up and them doing learning like one on one. We're trying to do more together because I realize that um, the two boys they 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 learn differently and their differences help each other. Um, so uh, because one has giftedness sort of in one area, it helps the other and, and vice versa. So um, we, we try to sit at the table and do a lot of group work together. And um, I try to be as or organized as I can. Um, so I have a lot of different, I don't know if you can see different organizational, uh, you know, places to put things. And, um, and then I like to display a lot of their work. So every time, every week when they do new things, I, I put, put it up for them to see. Um, and then we rotate it. And at the end of the year, we usually have what we call an art show <laughs> where we present their work and we um, celebrate it as a family. And it just keeps it fun. <laughs> My grown children said they want to go back and homeschool in Adriana's house. Like, <laughs> when they see it, they're like, yes, we want to be there. So it's so inviting. And the boys flourish in it from my perspective. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. It does. I love those hammock swings. They're so kids love them and yes. it's fun too. <laughs> <laughs> any any other questions that y'all had before with for Connie and Adriana before you? I guess, do you use all direct instruction now or do you sort of mix and match? Like I find for me, like I know that but the reading is, is just going brilliantly with the direct instruction. Um, and then we do some other curriculum stuff, but the stuff my kids have really taken off with has actually been like the unschooled stuff, like just when I support um, their interests and then just sort of essentially give them the materials and, and then just go and learn and then just, they've just absolutely blown me away with those areas of interest that they just love. So we sort of end up with um, a bit of a, uh, I don't know, a bit of a mix. Like, yeah, you've got to focus on some of those skills because kids don't necessarily aren't going to pick up those on their own, all of those foundational skills, but then they can sort of take it and run with other things. Does that sort of work? Do you sort of do a mix or have you just found that there's one method that works a lot better than other methods or how do you guys do it? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for those foundation skills, we definitely use the direct instruction and precision teaching. So with reading, math, um, uh, spelling, handwriting. Um, but my sons also are really interested in science and in history and in um, literature. So uh, for those, I like to um, sort of let them lead. So with uh, especially with science, my youngest son is really interested in nature and being outside in nature and asking questions. And I, I just love that. And um, we do a lot where we do hands-on learning and we um, do experiments. We, um, but I, I'm also trying to teach them, you know, like let's do it in a logical way, you know, like the scientific method, let's, let's put some of this together. I mean, at a very basic level, but you know, it has to be, a, a, you know, guided in a, you know, focused, structured way. And I do my best to do that. And um, there are, you know, different materials and resources out there that um, I like getting into good books too, to lead our um, learning. So a lot of times I'll frame it around a certain book um, or maybe parts of books from different um, things or poems we've been using poems um, because I love uh, science, but I also love how, um, art and literature can um, touch on those same themes of things that we see in the natural world, but in a, such a beautiful way and, and a unique way. So I try to do a little of both and um, I'd have a lot of fun with that. And um, I don't know, it's, it's a, it's sort of, for me, it's, it's create, it's a creative outlet um, more than like a burden, some like thing, oh, I have to do this, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, I'm blessed with that too. That reminds me that I was gonna tell the families that are there, not only is it the uniqueness of the student, some of the children love to draw. Some of the children love like what their unique gifts are, which is key. It's also good to remember, I think as the older grandmama in the room, I wanna encourage y'all that 
um, the things that you love to do will be used. They'll also catch your excitement and your joy for that. You are you, you too are uniquely gifted and have unique abilities and interests. Like Adriana is saying, it's a joy to do. The children that I tutor online, um, at the end of it, they, we have reward time for three to five minutes, depending. And um, it's a joy to me to do that with them. It's not like, okay, here's this token thing. It's so fun. The things that they're interested in, the things that come to mind for Adriana and I are things we love. And so then they catch a love for that. Maybe they hadn't known it before. So it's, it's both. And I think that is also a life skill to living in community. I want to listen to what you bring and your uniqueness. And I want to be free to bring what I love too. That's how we all learn. And I think that's a, a beautiful mosaic and a good, they're just, it's another way to be learning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love that. You know, one of the, <clears throat> One of the aspects of the collective that we're you know, trying to emphasize, in addition to direct instruction and precision teaching and you know, the pro-social skills and developing new nurturing environments is self-directed education. And that's that kind of that unschooling self-directed education model where you're following the lead of the child and you know, identifying what, did it, what are the things that they're really interested in. Um, you know, I have a family that we're, and we're working with through the collective that, you know, her child wants to go to Hawaii, she wants, she wants to live in Hawaii someday. And so she was like, can I, you know, create, you know, this lesson plan about Hawaii and we can do, you know, the geography and the animals. And the, I was like, yes, exactly. That's exactly right. Just take that small interest or that big, you know, that goal that they have don't squash their dreams, right? You're not going to say like, you're never going to go live in Hawaii. You're like, sure, let's, let's explore that. Let's really uh, capitalize on that. And then I love what you said, Connie, about, you know, families taking their own strengths and interests and being able to share those with their children in a way that, you know, I believe, I truly believe that learning direct instruction and learning precision teaching kind of just getting a foundational understanding of how teaching and learning happens like in an effective and efficient way those skills can then be generalized and applied to all of those other things like oh i've always wanted to teach my kid how to i don't know scrapbook or whatever you know it's like now i have a framework uh, to like teach them in a systematic way that is, you know, opens up to them. Or if, you know, like you were saying, <clears throat> the question from the parent here was, you know, about, you know, their interests. It's like, yes, if you're self-motivated and you're, you know, you can do this, then here is this. And, you know, I'll be here and I can answer questions and I can help you as you need, but it, then that builds their confidence and independence too. So. And again, on a lifetime skill, we want them to have ownership in things. Think long term. If you were hiring someone or you wanted someone to be in charge of a dream you have, you would certainly want them to have ownership and be willing to learn things on their own and follow that thought. And, you know, so it's just teaching on every level. And that's that really is exciting. I'm excited for you all to have the cooperative. That sounds great. <laughs> and one thing also I've learned is how. Um, this, like what you're saying, the direct instruction precision teaching can be applied to so many things that you might not have thought pre, like I thought it was all like academic when I started out, you know, reading math, like I can understand that. But then when I started working with different precision teachers with, for my older son, Samuel, they're targeting his um, fine motor, gross motor, um, language, um, also uh, his leisure skills and uh, games and play skills. And all of that can be, um, precision teaching, direct instruction can be used, like you're saying, to all of those things and um, make it so much um, more accessible to him to be how to, how to learn these things and, and also to identify where are, the, where's, where are the things where he needs help in. Um, where before it was like, yeah, I know he needs help in like all these areas, but I don't really know how to get going or how to focus in on teaching individual skills, um, the, the components that make up those composite um, skills that you want them to learn. So it's been really encouraging and effective, so effective. <laughs> 
Well, thank you both so much for joining us and sharing your experiences, sharing a little bit of your, um, you know, excitement and motivation for, you know, applying this in your homeschool. And we look forward to learning from you Hunter, in the future. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much for having us. Awesome. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, ladies. Appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.